Good morning and praise the Lord. Good to see you in the house of the Lord. I know it's a holiday season, long weekend. All right, and uh, quite a number are away traveling out station, right? Uh, we are glad that instead of traveling, you are here in the house of the Lord, worshiping the Lord together with us. And uh, you notice that this morning, uh, Pastor Francis and Pastor Ronnie are not around because they have actually gone to the Orang Asli, right? And uh, we are, they are there installing a new Orang Asli pastor. Right? We have engaged a new Orang Asli pastor. And uh, today, you know, they have gone and they have a combined service with the different uh, Orang Asli kampongs uh, together. They meet in one place and they have a combined service for the installation of the pastor. That's why both uh, Pastor Francis and Pastor Ronnie are there uh, together with them for the installation. Okay, good. All right. I trust that everyone is ready for the word of God. As you come in this morning, I hope you can uh, begin to send some uh, Christmas mood. Yeah, huh? yeah with a Christmas tree, uh, put up, you know, I hope that you will really, you know, uh, make us get excited and feel excited about it. Okay, have you ever asked the question, what is the meaning of life? Yeah, yeah. or perhaps you ask the question, why am I alive? Uh, what am I living for? You know, as human beings, we all need to have a sense of purpose. Or perhaps you can put it differently, we need to know our cause for living. Uh, without a cause, our life will be, with, will be meaningless. We do not know why we are living for. Now, young people, I know you are young. Now, you have a long journey ahead of you. Uh, some of you are only in your teens, you know. Some of you are in your early 30s. Do you know what is the purpose of your living? Uh, perhaps there's only one thing in your mind now. Right? You know that, oh, uh, uh, currently my cause, is, my cause for living is that I am to study. Right? Or perhaps you have been forced upon you to study. How nice you don't have to study, isn't it? Perhaps some of you have said, oh, my cause, I prefer play instead of study. <laughs> How many of you prefer that? <laughs> I prefer play and study. That's my cause of living. It, you know, right? If you're given a choice, you will have chosen something else. But today, let me bring to you that life is not just about play. Uh, life is also not just about work. There must be a reason for our being. And so I would like to entitle my message this morning as living for a cause. Living for a cause. In our IDMC you know, um, approach, and now we are still in the season of connect. Connecting with God, you know, connecting with the church, you know, we have our membership intake, and connecting to a cause. Why are we here? Why are we here on earth? Why are we here in church? Is there a cause for us? It is very important that we need to have a cause. We need to have a sense of purpose of why we are here for, and even as a church. Now, all of us know the Apostle Paul. Paul, towards the end of his life, he was being put in jail because he preached the word of God. And in fact, he knew that he would soon die as a martyr. He was under the persecution of the emperor. And so he began to pen his last letter to one of his spiritual sons by the name of Timothy. And we know that at that time, Timothy was pastoring a church in Ephesus. Right, but it, during that time, you know, he was going through some hardship because there was some false teaching going around, and the church was under tremendous pressure in view of different form of problems. Uh, there were troublemakers in the church. There were people who left the church. There were people who abandoned ship. So, you know, Timothy was feeling the pressure, and moreover, his mentor is now being put in jail. And all these things affected Timothy, and he wasn't strong enough to deal with it. And probably he was feeling intimidated, he was feeling rather discouraged. And because of this, you know, Paul began to write to him and remind him of his calling, and remind him of why he was doing what he was doing in the first place. So Paul urged him to stay true to the cause no matter what. And even as we look at 
the message of Paul to Timothy, I believe that the same message is for us. Uh, whether we are young or whether we are old, you know, we all need to know the cause. What we are do why are we doing what we are doing and why are we here in the first place? So first thing first, right, we need to know the cause. If not, we will be quite lost in life. So that's my first point. We need to know the cause. We know that God created man. He wants us to live our lives to the fullest. Uh, he wants us to live our life to the fullest. And he has created us to worship him. And he wants us to live our life for him. We all have a cause to live for. And we need to decide the cause we are committed to. Of course, Timothy calling was very specific. Uh, he have, God has given him certain spiritual gift. Uh, he was, you know, being a commission to do the work of the ministry. So his calling was to preach the gospel. His calling was to pastor the church. But as the pressure was building up, right, it, it affected Timothy's confidence. And he was probably afraid of even identifying with Paul because Paul was in jail. And normally, you know, people shy away from, uh, you know, connecting or associating with somebody that's in jail. Perhaps he feel embarrassed, you know, and perhaps he feel afraid. If they can put Paul in jail, they can also put him in jail. And so maybe all these questions come to his mind, all the negative emotions come to him, you know. And so as, because of this, you know, Paul has to encourage him. And so in 2 Timothy chapter 1, uh, my message today is based on 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5 to verse 12. But let's just take a look at what Paul has to say to Timothy in uh, verse 7 and verse 8. He says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear in timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. So never be ashamed to tell others about our Lord. And don't be ashamed of me either, even though I'm in prison for him. With the strength God gives you, be ready to suffer with me for the sake of the good news. And so in these two verses, Paul was asking Timothy not to be ashamed. Right? Twice he mentioned the word not to be ashamed. Not to be ashamed to tell others. That means not to be ashamed to continue to preach the word and not to be ashamed of me, Paul was telling him. All right? And uh, even though he may face rejection, persecution, all right, and intimidation, you know, and uh, opposition, he must not be ashamed. Right? And he must not be ashamed with, associated with Paul. Why? Because Paul was in jail, not because he had done something wrong. He didn't rob the bank. Uh, he didn't kill somebody but rather he was injured because he was preaching the truth. So to Paul, suffering for the gospel is a badge of honor. Paul himself was not even ashamed of being put in jail. He counted a badge of honor. He was willing not only to suffer, but he was willing to die for the cause. Right? He was willing not to only suffer, but to die for the cause. Therefore, Timothy should not shy away from it. Instead, Timothy should stay strong, as God enabled him and continue to live for the cause. Paul went on to say in, this, in the following verses that our Lord Jesus himself too, he has set the example of what it means to live for a cause. So let's continue looking at verse 9 onwards, right? verse 9 and 10. For God saved us and called us to live a holy life. He did this not because we deserve it, but because that was his plan from before the beginning of time to show us his grace through Christ Jesus. And now he has made all of this plan to us by the appearing of Christ Jesus, our Savior. He broke the power of death and illuminated the way to life and immortality through the good news. So to put it simply, to just summarize what Paul was saying here, he was telling us that God has a plan. God has a plan to save mankind, and therefore, he sent Jesus. And Jesus was to die before he could conquer death. So Jesus came with a cause. Right? He came for a cause. So when Jesus was arrested, and when he was brought before the Roman governor, Pilate, Pontius Pilate, and this is what Pilate you know, asked him, and in John chapter 18, verse 37, and this is how Paul, uh, Jesus responded. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. He said what? 
For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth bear, hears my voice. You see, when Jesus came, he came for a cause. Right? And we are going to celebrate Christmas soon. Remember, Christmas is because of a cause. Right? Jesus came for a cause. He came to save us. He came to eventually die for us. So he came with a sense of mission. Right? He came uh, with a cause and indeed he fulfilled that cause in the span of his life on earth. He has done that for us. So we both this example, we pause personal example and pointing to the example of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now Timothy must not forget about the cause he was called to. And he need to stay true to it and press on. So let me ask you a question. At this juncture of your life, do you have a cause to live for? At this juncture of your life, if you are a young person, ask yourself, at this juncture of your life, what is your cause? If you are working adult, what is your cause? And if you are a senior citizen, what are you living for right now? All right? To the young people, perhaps you have a career to pursue. Yes, we talk about study. You are not just going to finish you know, your Form 5 you know, or your, your O level or your L level, but you are going to pursue probably a degree. Right? And, and, and what you want to pursue depends on your life ambition, what you want to do. So that may be your cause at this moment, and there's nothing wrong because we all go through that process. So most young people will think of you know, what I want to be sometime in the future. Right? So maybe this is what you are thinking about. Right? And of course, you know, for the retiree and the senior citizen, what is your cause? You have gone through the stage of youthhood. You have gone through the stage of working so hard to fend for the family. And you have retired and you are now a senior citizen. So at this stage of your life, what is your cause? Is it just to take care of your grandchildren? Nothing wrong, it's good, right? Uh, it's good to take care of them, play with them. Or perhaps you say that, oh, this is a season of my life, I just concentrate in enjoying travel right nothing wrong travel while you can while your leg is still able to carry you while you still can move nothing wrong yes right nothing wrong with all this this can be things that you can enjoy in life after working so hard and nothing wrong to enjoy life isn't it right? it's nothing wrong to enjoy life as long as we do so right knowing what is the purpose we are doing and we do not go overboard and of course, for the working, many of the working adults, right, you, uh, you are in, in the season of your life where you are most busy. <laughs> uh, you are most busy because you are building up a home, your family is raising up children, you know, and then you, know, you are uh, 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 establishing not only your career, but also, you know, uh, want, want to have stability of your family, thinking of your ch uh, children's future, so on and so forth. But let me put forward to you that as Christian, beside our personal cause of pursuing a career, of studying, of traveling at this uh, stage of life, or building up our, our you know, uh, family resources for those that are working, we also have a common cause that we cannot ignore. We have a common cause that cannot ignore. And that common cause is a divine cause. And that cause is the great commission of Christ. That is a cause that Jesus has given to each and every one of us. Even as you pursue your personal cause in this life, it all should lead you back to this divine cause. You can live out your passion and dream. Be the if your dream is to be you know, a, a, a doctor, be the best doctor you can. If your dream is to be an engineer, be the best engineer you can. If your dream is to be an accountant, be the best accountant you can. Yes, you can pursue all your dream that you want to. But in all our pursuit of our passion and dream, our most important life goal is still to point people to Jesus. Let us not forget that common cause. And let us not forget that divine cause. 
But unfortunately, many times, you know, we just focus on our earthly cause that we forget about the heavenly cause. We so focus on the material that we forget about the spiritual. And today, I hope that this message will remind us that even as we pursue our personal cause in this life, our early cause, let us bear in mind the very big cause that God has given to each and every one of us. Young people, I want you to consider your life course above and beyond what you want to do. Right? And you can actually start living off the divine course now. You don't have to wait. Okay, now my concentration is study. After I study, after I get my degree, after I settle down, then only I think of the divine course. No, you don't have to wait until later on. Right where you are, even as you are, perhaps you are a teenager, uh, you just enter into, you know, uh, secondary school, you still can start living your life for Jesus. It's never too young to start. Because the Bible tells us that you must, you must not look down upon yourself. You must, look, you must not look down on your youth. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, what the, it tells us, it says that don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. All right? So you can start young. While you are, it's not too young to live out for the divine cause. You can reach your generation that I can't reach. I may not be able to talk to your friend the way you talk to them. I may not be able to reach them, you know, because young people, when they see us coming, they say, hey, your uncle coming, your auntie coming, uh, let's change subject. <laughs> we may not be able to speak your lingo. And uh, in the last leaders' conference, you know, Archison led us into a very interesting icebreaker, uh, icebreaker of understanding the language of Gen Z. We can't speak your language with all your terminology, your W, your L, and your what? I, Y, I, Y, K, Y, K, whatever, K. We, we don't understand. <laughs> so only you can reach your generation. You see, so you have to start leaving the divine cause. You cannot wait for the church to do it. You cannot wait for the uncle, auntie to, to bring the gospel to your friend. You have to start doing that. That is your divine cause. You can start doing it, right? You, you, when you mingle around, when you go and, you know, uh, uh, have a cup of tea with them, when you go makan makan in Mekti or KFC or whatever is that, you can mingle around and you can speak their language. Start living out your divine cause. And you don't have to be called to be an evangelist to do that. Your life, your life itself can shine. Senior citizen and retiree, many of you are here. I will soon be joining you. <laughs> <laughs> right. And you have the time, but not much energy. The young people, they have the time, they have the energy, they got no money. Actually, not true. They can always get their parents' money, right? <laughs> Senior citizen, uh, many of you have the money. You have not much time left, <laughs> but you also have a lot of time to spare in the sense. You know, <laughs> in a sense, you also have a lot of time because you don't have to work already, but you don't have much energy. So what are you going to do? Right? What can you do? You still can reach out to your energy who have the time now to sit down and talk anything under the sun. Right? Now you see many senior citizens go to the park, exercise. Yes, you join them in the park. You can see senior citizens after the park, they go and yam cha. Right? The day is long. How to spend the time? You yam cha with them. And you, in one way or another, you try to share the gospel with them. Maybe it's a good season for you to reconnect and rebuild old friendship. People that you have not met for some time. Remember them. Especially you know that, oh, this good friend of mine. Uh, as far as I know, uh, he is not in the faith yet. Start connecting. Start building up because this is the season in your life you have to give it the last shot to live your life for Jesus. You cannot say that, oh, my prime is over. Yeah, your prime of life is over, but this is a season of life that you still can be very fruitful for the Lord. 
you still can be, you still can continue to live off your cost because this is your last, what you call that, your last journey. This is your last opportunity that God has given you to live for the cost. So you must not let this opportunity pass by because once it's passed by, there's no return. We are not like the young people and say that, I am maybe next 40 years, uh, you don't have a next 40 years, you know. <laughs> Moses at 340. Uh, many of us are already in our third 40. There are not that many 40 for us to think another time. There's no another time. This is the best time uh, to give it your last shot to live for Jesus. The working of adults, you have the money, you have the energy, but you've got no time. Right? That's what happened. Right? You are so hard pressed for time, but you still can intentionally live out for the divine cause. You still can do it intentionally. Find time, seize opportunity in whatever way. Most important of all, by your own lifestyle. Your own lifestyle speaks the loudest. It's not what you say a lot of time, it's not what you do a lot of time, but it's by your life, it speaks the loudest. And your life in the marketplace is the life that you have to shine for Jesus and you have to live up your cause in the marketplace itself. So Paul reminded Timothy of the cause. He also reminded Timothy of the enablement because Timothy was afraid, Timothy was feeling discouraged, and perhaps some of us here are thinking, do you think I can do it? I'm, I'm so young, you know. Uh, I, I'm not eloquent. You know, like Moses gave the excuse, I'm not eloquent. I don't think I can do it. Like some of us say, that, you know, I'm a timid person. You know, uh, maybe I should also change my name to Timothy. I'm very timid, you know. That kind of thing. Some of you say, you know, I, I, I am an introvert. Right? I, I cannot really, you know, speak to the crowd. Nobody asks you to speak to the crowd. Just connect individually. I just make the connection and connect them to Christ, you see. And so even though when we feel that we are not able to, but the good news is that, that we are empowered to live for the cause, right? So we are empowered to live for the cause. This is what Paul told Timothy. So living for the cause is not always easy, especially when the odds is stacked against you. So just like Timothy, the odds was against him. But Paul reminded him that he was not alone in this because God has given him all that he needed in order to commit and live for the cause. Now, what has God provided for Timothy? Verse 5 to verse 7, we can see that. You see, I remember your genuine faith, for you share the faith that first lived, first filled your grandmother Louis and your mother Eunice, and I know the same faith continues strong in you. This is why I remind you to fan into flame the spiritual gift God gave you when I laid hands on you. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. So you notice that Timothy has a good start in his spiritual life and ministry. Uh, he had a godly legacy. He grew up in a godly environment with spiritual support. Uh, he has spiritual gift. He knew his gifting. Uh, that was to his advantage. When you know your gifting, that's to your advantage. And the Holy Spirit will continue to help him because he was anointed by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit will help him to counter his fear, counter his timidity. Instead, will give him you know, the love uh, 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 and of a sound mind as well. So you see, when God calls us for a cause, or leads us for a cause, he also equips us with the, necess with the necessary gifting and ability to fulfill the cause. <coughs> So therefore, with this enablement, Timothy and us as well, we must live for a cause that is bigger than ourselves. Uh, even though we look at our own situation, we look at our own limitation, we may think that we can't do it, but with the enablement of God, we are able to live for a cause that is greater than ourselves. So therefore, Timothy must not look inward. He must not look inward, he must not look at the environment and then, you know, be afraid. <clears throat> Rather, he should look upward. He should look upward and he must continue with the fight. And so continuing in verse 13 and 14, this is how Paul continued to encourage Timothy to hold on to the faith and to guard the truth. He said, hold on to the pattern of wholesome teaching you learn from me. 
a pattern shaped by the faith and love that you have in Christ Jesus. Through the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within us, carefully guard the precious truth that has been entrusted to you. So it was very important. You say, hold on to it, <clears throat> and you must guard it. Right? You must not give up easy in life. So even as we live for the cause, we must do so with tenacity. We must be able to follow through. You notice that people who have a sense of God's calling, who have a sense of purpose and cause in their life, they do not give up easily, right? They need to have the conviction and the passion. When you have the conviction and the passion, you will press on. Even in the world, whether people who know God or people who do not know God, if they have a cause to fight for, and when they have the passion and conviction, you realize that they will go all out for it, even though right, they face with a lot of obstacles. Of course, you look at some of the activists around. Right? Activists in the world, activists in the country, you know. Some of them are very passionate about the cause. Right? Uh, 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 say, for example, uh, nowadays, uh, the big thing is... Uh, what you call climate change. You know, you have all the activists, you know, that come together, take, talk about climate change. Now, that is their cause now they want to fight for. You will have activists that talk about human rights or humanity or whatever, you know, uh, especially over the uh, current world. You have different activists uh, uh, trying to fight for different cause. Right? And these activists, you realize that when they have a passion, not only they are willing to fight for the cause, they are willing to die for the cause. Uh, you have people uh, who are so full of passion, who live for a cause, live for you know a, a human right against apartheid. For example, you know the late <coughs> Nelson Mandela. He was put in jail long term, long time jail, but then the passion, the cause that he fight for, was still there with him when he was released. You know, so that was the cause that he fight for against apartheid. Uh, what about people who fight against racism, like you know Martin Luther King? That was his cause. You see, he fight for the cause. He want to have, uh, you know, a, a freedom in his land. He 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 want to see, you know, his own country, uh, uh, free of racism and so on and so forth. So these people fight for a cause, and it was not easy for them. And we know Martin Luther King actually died for his cause. He was assassinated. He was killed, right? So people who have a sense of cause, who have a sense of passion, they really go all out for it. Now, when we look at this example of people, some may be Christian, some may not be Christian. But you look at the way they go all out for their cause. We have to ask ourselves, do I have the same passion to go all out? Right? Many of these people, they may not even have the enablement of God, but we have the enablement of the Holy Spirit to live our cause for Jesus. So all the more, all the more we must have the tenacity, we must be passionate about the divine cause uh, when we have the passion, many things can be done. Many things can be done with the help of the Holy Spirit. Remember our memory verse for November? What does it say, Hebrews chapter 13 verse 6? And what does it say? So we say with confidence. Can we all say it together? One, two. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper and I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? All right? So because of the enablement of God, and God is our helper, God is able to help us to live out our cause. So let's live our cause for Jesus. And finally, <clears throat> we must not be ashamed of the cause. We must not be ashamed of the cause. Having said what is necessary to Timothy, Paul now turned to himself. Now he talked about himself. He just don't want to teach somebody else, but he talked about himself. And, you know, uh, um, he talked about himself as an example. Let's look at verse 11 and verse 12. This is what Paul said, And God chose me to be a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of this good news. That is why I am suffering here in prison. But I am not ashamed of it, for I know the one in whom I trust, and I am sure that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until the day of his return. Now, Paul recognized God's calling in his life. He was willing to take up the cause. He committed himself to the cause. And Paul had a deep sense of conviction and purpose. 
Paul was very determined. Right? As we know Paul, he was very determined to carry out the cause. He was not ashamed to suffer for the cause. He said these two things. He was not ashamed of the gospel. He was not ashamed of the chain uh, that, he was, that he was carrying. Now sadly, <clears throat> not everyone thinks like Paul. Even during Paul's time, even among Paul's associates and friends, even believers in the early church, not everyone thought like Paul. There were those who turned away from the cause and they deserted Paul in his struggle. Right? And uh, in fact, in verse 15, it's not on the screen, but let me just read to you. In verse 15, Paul told them that, as you know, everyone from the province of Asia had deserted me. Wow, can you imagine? Paul said, everyone. Maybe, you know, he was uh, 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 exaggerating a bit, you know, using some figure of speech. But the fact is that, that you can say a lot of people have deserted him, even Phygelus uh, and Hermogenes. So he mentioned two particular persons. Right? Maybe he was really upset with these two persons. Maybe these two persons was really either close to him or his co-worker, and even they have given up, you know, they deserted him. So not everybody was able to stand with Paul in his cause. Why? Why did they desert Paul? Probably they were ashamed to be associated with a prisoner. Right? Probably they were afraid to be persecuted. Probably they were afraid to be arrested. So it is easy to jump ship when the going gets tough, isn't it? It's so easy to jump ship. Chabut. Same thing when Jesus was arrested at the Garden of Gethsemane. What happened to the disciples? They fled. They ran away. Right? So very natural human reaction. Ran away. You know, right? You fend for yourself. Unfortunately, this is the reality of life, even among the people of God. It happened then. It's still happening now. And so this is where we have to ask ourselves, we have to search our heart, which group do I belong to? But thank God, even though many of the people have deserted Paul, and Paul even singled out these two persons, but thank God that there were still those who were willing to come alongside Paul and support him. Uh, and here, Paul talked about <clears throat> uh, verse 16 and 17. Yeah, do I have that? Right? He talked about another person. He said, May the Lord show special kindness to Onesiphorus and all his family because he often visited and encouraged me. He was never ashamed of me because I was in chain. When he came to Rome, he searched everywhere until he found me. May the Lord show him special kindness on the day of Christ's return. And you know very well how helpful he was in Ephesus. But thank God Paul said, even though many have deserted me, but Onesiphorus was a different one. He supported me in my cause. He was not ashamed of my chain. It was co-workers, it was associates, it was supporters like this that kept Paul going. Uh, Paul must not let them down. Together, they must carry the cross and together, they must continue to live for the cause and fight for the cause. So which group you think you belong to? If you have a choice, which group would you want to be in? Like those who deserted Paul, jump ship easily when the going gets tough, or those who are not ashamed, for those who say that, Paul, we, are, we stand by you. We stand by you. We are still with you. And what about you? Are you willing, like Paul, to continue on with the cause no matter how tough it is? So Paul also said that he was not ashamed. He was glad that Onesiphorus was not ashamed of him. He asked Timothy not to be ashamed of him. Now he talked about himself that he was not ashamed. Why was Paul so confident and full of self-esteem while he was in prison, while he was facing impending death? Why was Paul still so confident? Right? Now, let's take a look why. First of all, he knew the power of the gospel. Paul was not ashamed of the gospel because he knew the power of the gospel. In Romans chapter 1, verse 16, 
It tells us that I am not ashamed of the gospel. This is Paul writing actually, right? I am not ashamed of the gospel because it's a power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. Paul himself had many first-hand encounters of the power of God. When he went about preaching the gospel, when he went about doing God's work, Paul had personally encountered, witnessed the tremendous power of God, transforming life, delivering people who are under demonic bondage, healing the sick, and so on and so forth. That is the power of the gospel. But most important power of the gospel is the conviction of sin and transforming life. It's not the miracles, signs, and wonders. Yes, those are all the physical things that you can see. But life's transformation is the greatest miracle and the greatest power of all. Because when you talk about healing the sick, yeah, given the right diagnostic and medication, doctor can heal the sick too. But doctor cannot transform life, isn't it? All right? But it is not all this external healing, but the internal change of life. That is the power of God. And how many of us have experienced that power of the gospel in your life? You have received, raise your hand. Have you received the power of God? Yes, we have. If we personally have received the power of God, the power of the gospel, then, like Paul, we shouldn't be ashamed of it. We should be willing to talk about it. <clears throat> right? So with this testimony, there's no need to be ashamed. Paul said that I don't need to be ashamed because of the many testimonies that I have a witness. Right? He has every reason to keep proclaiming it. And we ourselves are the testimony, and perhaps we have you know, known individuals whose life have been transformed by the power of the gospel. And all this gave us the assurance uh, that we do not need to be ashamed. And not only he knew the power of the gospel, secondly, he knew the power of the one whom he believed in. Right? And I like it that's put in the NIV. And let's take a look at the NIV. He said that yet this is no cause for shame because I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he's able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. Paul said he knows whom he has believed, the one he trusts. His faith was in the Lord Jesus and no one else. He said, that's the one I believe. That's the one I trust. Man can deserve him, but Jesus will never leave him nor forsake him. Those in Asia have deserted me, but the Lord, is always with me. The Lord is my helper. You know? Right? And do you know the God that you believe in? That's my question to you. Do you know the God that you believe in? You do not know the God that you believe in, you will not be convinced. You will not be persuaded. But Paul said, because I know whom I believe, therefore I am convinced or I am persuaded. So you need to be convinced, you need to be persuaded of the one you can trust is that, that you must know you must know. So how well do you know God in your life? How well do you know him? How well do you know Jesus in your life? Right? So his faith was on the Lord Jesus Christ. So we have to ask ourselves, and I believe that this is one of the most powerful statements of Paul, and I love this statement. I know whom I believe. Do you know the one that you believe? Now, it speaks of the knowledge of God. It speaks of the relationship with God. So my question to you is, do you know God personally? How personal do you know Him? Do you know Him enough to bring forth such conviction in you? Are you able to say the same thing like Apostle Paul? I know whom I believe. We must know the one we believe in. Amen? Amen. We must know Him. Right? He is... Because Paul knew this God, he was convinced, he was persuaded that God would guard what we have entrusted to him. Whatever we have surrendered to God. Some, many times we say that, okay, we surrender to God. We commit ourselves to God. We commit our life to God. We commit our career to God. We commit our future to God. Now, you commit all this to someone, you have to make sure that the person is able to guard it for you. You have to make sure that the person is able to take care of you. Now, when you go for a long holiday, who do you ask to help take care of your house? Who do you entrust the care of your house to? 
Who? Maybe some family member that live nearby, isn't it? If you have family member that live nearby, you say, hey, I'll be away you know, for two weeks. Uh, can you help jaga my house a bit? Uh, here is a house key, right? Now, if you do not have family members nearby, who do you entrust to? A trusted friend. Maybe a trusted church member. Am I right? Yeah. right? Brother, can you go to my house? Uh, take a look. Uh, look, see, look, see, can ready, uh, you know? Uh, here is a house key in case of anything. Right? And, or perhaps, your neighbor, if you know your neighbor well enough, you trust your neighbor well enough, you will pass it to a neighbor. You see? Uh, just in case any delivery, can you help to take care for me? I won't be around. Right? So what will you do? Right? You will hand over the key, your house key right, when you're away to somebody you know well enough that you can trust. You will not simply put, you know, you dare not even put, uh, pass it to those security guard that are guarding the boom gate at your house, do you dare to pass your house key to them? How many of you were there? Were you? You weren't there. Because all these security guard, every now and then they change. You don't even know their name. You can't even recognize them. Sometimes they all look the same. <laughs> right? You don't know them. You won't dare to entrust your house key to them. Right? Just in case you know, something else will happen. Right? You will entrust to somebody that you can trust. <clears throat> Similarly, our God can be trusted. And whatever we entrust to Him, He will take care. He will take care of us. He will take care of our life. He will take care of our family. That's why Paul was not ashamed of the cause. He was willing to die for the cause because he said, I know the one I believe in. I know whom I have believed. I can trust Him. And whatever I entrust to Him, what will he do for me? He will guard for me. Right? He will guard what I have entrusted to him. He will take care of it. So because of that, Paul said, I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of my chain. The gospel is the power of God. The God I serve is the one that can be trusted. So church, are you ashamed of the gospel? Christmas is coming. Please make sure that we are not talking about Santa Claus and Christmas tree alone, even though Christmas tree is nice for decoration. But remember to speak about Jesus. Are you ashamed to identify yourself as a Christian? Don't be ashamed to wear the cross. Of course, to bear the cross. We should not and we must not be ashamed because he's the one who is able to take care of us when no one else is there for us. When all else fail, Jesus never failed. Amen? When all else fail, Jesus never failed. So we must be willing to live for our cause bigger than ourselves. What about as a church? Do we have a reason of being here at Subang Jaya Assembly of God? As a church, do we have a cause to live for? Yes, we do have. We have a fivefold mission. And our fivefold mission spelled out the cause that we are committed to. As a church, we are committed to true worship. Uh, we are committed to maximum discipleship, to authentic fellowship, to anointed ministry, to effective missions and evangelism. And these are the things that we will keep doing. Uh, and it ties in very well with our IDMC that we, all these things is what we do as a church. That is our cause to live for. So that... Our vision, our goal, right, is what we want, is that we, we, we want to fulfill our vision as a missionary church that transforms lives and impacts nations. And that is our cause here at Subang Jaya Assembly of God. So when you are here, when you are in this family, remember that as a believer, you can have your personal cause to pursue while on this earth, but do not forget about the divine cause. And as part of this family of God, we are here not just to enjoy church, not just to enjoy good uh, uh, worship, not just to enjoy wonderful fellowship, but there is a cause for this church that we want to be a missionary church. Wherever we are, we want to bear witness for Christ. And we want not only to make our lives count, we want to be able to influence others for Christ. That is our cause. And I encourage all of us to join us. 
Join the church for this cause when you are part of Subang Jaya Assembly of God. When you worship with us, you are connected to us. Let me tell you, be connected to the cause that we are. That we are a disciple-making church. That we want to fulfill the great commission of Christ and we want to be missionary disciples for him. Amen? Amen. Amen. Can I have the worship team come along, you know? And, uh,